Okay, it's already nine past, so we can uh, we can reconvene for this last day of the of the school. Uh, and as you can see, this is the bottom to the Peter St. Peter question. So, are you ready? Okay, I I I don't know if you're ready. So yes, yeah. So in this case, let me judge if you're ready. So please connect with your uh, smartphone or with your uh, computer to this uh, to this site uh, for uh, for the audience online as well. Of course, you can participate. So it's booklab.com and you put uh, slash uh, second. You don't need to put necessarily your name. You can put your name. You can put the fake name, whatever. It's not a, a, a test. It's more of a survey. But I want to, to see what you're going to, to answer to a couple of questions. So let's see if you're ready. Okay. So we're going to start in a couple of seconds. <laughs> quick, quick. In a couple of seconds, we're going to start. <laughs> Everyone's done? Okay, then. For those who arrived, you can connect to this website, but we have to start. Otherwise, we're going to run late, and the other uh, speaker will not be happy with me. So, wooklab.com slash seeker. Okay. Let's start then. Okay. You have to, cho to choose between these uh, four, uh, four choices. And the question is, can we accurately describe the fundamental gap of materials? The possible choice. Yes, the thick on a sham is Only if we have the exact BC by looking at the cone sham by the values. Simple. Oh, yes, but maybe we have to do something more than LDA, like GGA. Or we have to go beyond the cone sham eigenvalues to get the. <coughs> so, I'll wait another couple of seconds and then uh, you want to reveal the question, uh, the, the answer. Yeah. One, two, Ah, let's see the result first. Ah, I like that. Very good. <laughs> Alec, you see, your, uh, your polemic uh, verb was uh, clearly, clearly efficient. Okay. Okay, let's go to the second question. What spectroscopy would you use to measure the optical gap? Okay, possible options, photo emission, ellipsometry. Photo emission and inverse photo emission or inelastic X ray scatter. Again, a couple of seconds and then uh, it's done. Uh -huh. Okay, this. It's not a good answer. You don't remember what is the optical gap. It's not the fundamental gap. And so you need an optical experiment to do. And if you do inverse n time photo emission, you will get the photo emission band gap, which is not the, So we have to start all over again. I'm sorry. <laughs> Only one. I will try. <laughs> okay. The correct answer was ellipsoid. But well, someone got it. Okay. <laughs> In TDDFT, what do we mean by random phase approximation? Keeping V and putting FXC to zero in the kernel of the Dyson equation. Yeah. 
for keeping FXC in LDA and putting V, <coughs> putting both V and FXC to zero, <coughs> for keeping both V and FXC, but uh, the FXC in any non adiabatic approximation. Okay. Let's see the answers so far. Oh, come on. Quick up. What it could be? One, two, three. See the result. Very good. Fxc equals zero. So again, the part covered by Valerio apparently was uh, very, very <laughs> clear. I don't know if he menaced you by something. It's my in indoctrination power. <laughs> <laughs> we had someone who is, uh, he got everything right. Good. Good. Okay. <laughs> What do you need to obtain the second harmonic generation? Full linear response parallelizability, but with a non adiabatic approximation, so something that is dynamic that depends on the frequency, or a second order polarizability, third order polarizability, or really we need the non perturbative approaches, non perturbative in the potentials. What is it? Come on, five seconds. Okay, three, two, one. Very good. We need the second order for the second harmonic generation. That's correct. Okay, another two questions. What is the main feature you get from the loss function that you measure, for example, in electronic electron energy loss spectroscopy or in elastic history scattering? You get the absorption peak as the main feature or the band gap, <laughs> the X boson frequency, <laughs> or the plasma. I want to accept you. <laughs> Okay, come on. Five seconds. Two, one. Synthesis. Okay. So here, actually, beside the, the X boson, they were not totally wrong answer, but it is true that the main feature, it will always be the plasma that you see. If a system has a plasma, you will see it as a big potato in the, in the spectrum. And of course, we will also see some interband transition, some, uh, for example, some excitons, but they will be lower down at a lower energy. And they would be much, much uh, screened by the fact that we have an epsilon one that is very big. So, uh, so plasma was the, the let's say the, the main feature that we see. Yeah. Okay, let's go to the last question. I'm afraid that this is a question more pertinent to the people who are present here, but uh, of course the, the online audience can participate. As well. So, what is the name of the bar on the terrace above Place de la Ribonne, close to the hotel? Don't Google it because this I will give you only five, four, three, two. So, what was the central second bar, the sweet polyvalent, the great escape, or the final convergence? Three, two, one. <laughs> Yeah, this is okay, so it was the great escape. It was okay, at least the night session was uh, was okay. 
There was one some five second back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, there were people of the second man. Oh well, precisely. I mean, on the terrace above the Place de la Ripon is quite clear. Very well. And then where I have to go? Here, go. Here. Okay. So let's say that we are more or less prepared, but I, I'm gonna to emphasize more. Uh, uh, and things that we are going to get with the Bethesda meter, which is indeed uh, the optical gap, which is where you lack some. Okay. Uh, so why do we need, why do we do that? Why do we need that? And so the the main motivation is about uh, accuracy. It's about the capabilities of a previous uh, uh, previously seen method, like in TDDFT. It was emphasized that TDDFT, an exact theory for the polarizability for the linear order, but also for the second order, if you go to second order, uh, and also in non-perturbative approaches, an exact theory, unfortunately, will lack a good function to describe optical absorption, especially on solids. Simple molecules without uh, strange features like charge transfer, we can also get something, something good out of it. But optical absorption solids, not good enough. And we can even use very fancy kernels, but well beyond uh, LDA, but we don't obtain uh, a good result. And this is, for example, the typical case of uh, uh, silicon. Uh, and if you do, for example, a simple independent particle RDA, uh, which, is, which means essentially getting just the chi zero and getting the macroscopic component and the imaginary part, we will get uh, something, uh, something like this clearly. Okay, we are in the range, but uh, clearly not good enough. And uh, the first thing that we notice is, uh, well, the position is not really centered on top of the experiment. And we know that because uh, uh, the, uh, this kind of spectrum has peaks whenever there are eigenvalues difference in the Cone shell and using LDA. And when we do that, of course, we will uh, create a transition using the Cone shell eigenvalues, and our, our, uh, our spectrum will be centered there. And so it will be centered using a very small band gap, which is far from the, from the, from the real one. And so we might uh, say, well, what happens if we use, um, for example, GW correct? Because yesterday you did GW calculation and you saw that you can correct the band structure and you can use your uh, GW correction. In the case of silicon, the correction at the gamma point is enough and then you use this correction for all the bands, for all the conduction bands, for instance, the dispersion is very, very small. And, uh, and of course, it's not astonishing that what you get is just a, a rigid shift of your spectrum because you have moved up the conduction bands. But you say, well, yes, but this is just chi zero, right? This is not the full polarizability, it's the independent particle polarizer. What about if you do PDDFT and uh, we put uh, the dice on a question? And uh, we do that. We do that. And, uh, and if you use the exchange correlation kernel in the adiabatic LDA, in the adiabatic LDA we won't get much farther in this uh, in the good direction so the the spectrum is uh, barely distinguishable from the rpa okay so this is not enough and this is not uh, because i picked silicon as a pathological element uh, i mean it, it can be worse but i will show the also the solid uh, argon where there the mismatch is even more uh, more drastic so there are nothing to do with that really LDA or RDA in the experiment have nothing to do. So what we do? Well, we have to search for a different uh, for a different approach. And unsurprisingly enough, what we're gonna use is the Green's functional approach. Okay, so we have seen yesterday this uh, this set of uh, of uh, integral differential equation called the Edin's equation that are in principle exact, very difficult to solve, actually not solvable in a simple way at all. Um, and so what we can do with that? Okay, so this is the, uh, the outline then. We're gonna uh, first derive 
a formalism in which we can calculate the polarizability but using this function. And then we will try to see how to solve this, uh, this uh, final equation that we find for the chi. It's called the Benz Alpiter equation in, uh, in practice. Uh, we have only uh, three quarters of an hour, more or less, so I will not uh, dwell too much into the details, but of course the derivation is by definition is complicated with mathematics, and then I just skip to the physics of it for the practical uh, BSC, okay? And of course, questions and, uh, and comments are, uh, are welcome, and, uh, and of course we continue this uh, also in the afternoon. So, the, our aim is to evaluate this guy, no? Because we saw that uh, the polarizability, then it is related to the, to the inverse electric function, then the macroscopic is related to a whole bunch of spectroscopies. And the polarizability is the linear response function that connects an external applied potential and the variation of the density. Or if you want, you can read it as the function of the of the density with respect to the external potential, it's the same thing. But this is what we want. And now we want to say, okay, but this is in the density formalism because the density appears. And we want to use the Green's function, not the density. So any ideas? Is the, for example, the density related to the Green's function in some way? Yeah, we have the definition of rho equals E times the Green function and not rho. But to follow. Sorry. From the time ago, if, I, if I remember properly, we had that the density yeah. equals to the imaginary unit times the Green's function. The trace. The trace of the Green's function. So, because the Green's function contains a lot of information and it's the, the propagation of uh, one particle, can be an electron or a hole, between position one and two. And the density depends only on one because it's the propagation of the density. Okay? So indeed, it is the diagonal of the Green's function. So this, we could simply write it like the variation of the diagonal of the Green's function with respect to, again, a sort of a generalized potential, but for which if we take the same argument is again the external potential that we apply. So this is our uh, normal polarizability. And so with this in mind, we can define a four-point polarizability that we call L, which is the functional derivative of the Green's function, the full Green's function, with respect to a generalized external potential that depends, it's no local, depends on two points. Okay, and we know that if we, by this, we take the diagonal, we take the index two equal one and four equal three, we end up in the causal uh, measurable, let's say, polarizability, which is normally a two point, the normal uh, polarizability, the response function between external potential and the density. Okay? So this is our definition, and uh, it involves Green's function. And uh, to connect to what uh, uh, Matteo said yesterday, this L is also the part, the correlated part of the two particle Green's function. So if we write in the, our hierarchy, the two particle Green's function that we now contain the four uh, field operator instead of uh, two, and we remove the, the, uh, the product of uh, two one particle Green's function, what we obtain is L. So it's another way to define the L. Because what Matteo said, uh, yesterday morning, it was that uh, you can transform the second order Green's function in your hierarchy, you transform it into a um, functional derivative of the Green's function with respect to a generalized external potential, which is exactly what we did here. So the two, uh, the two sides are equivalent, we can define from one way or to the other way. Okay, so we have a definition for the polarizability in the domain of the Green's function. It is a nasty beast because it depends on uh, R1, R2, and R3, R4, and time one, time two, time three, time four. So it's a very complicated object, but it contains the Green's function. So now, what do we do? But now that we have uh, the Green's function that clears up here, 
we can put the Green's function there. Do we know how to evaluate the Green's function? How did we do yesterday to evaluate the Green's function? For example, for some of you a right to plot the spectral function, which is the imaginary part of G. So you calculated the Green's function with Abilene, right? How did you do it? Need the self-energy, self yes. But the self-energy, do you have it? No, we need the potential. Do you have it exactly? I mean? No. No. So you use approximation also there. But it's better, we saw that uh, it's better to devise approximation for the self-energy. Yes, there is a question. Uh -huh. oh, okay. So it's better to devise approximation for the self-energy rather than the Green's function itself. So why not use the Dyson equation? So instead of using the Green's function, we use its definition in terms of the self-energy, which is what we have there on the, on the right. But this is very uh, complicated to use because you see that then we will have to do the functional derivative of an inverse operator that contains actually our uh, operators, uh, uh, which are V hard three and sigma. So here we use a, a simple trick. We said, instead of using this uh, way to write the Dyson equation, we use uh, the other way, in which we define everything in terms of the inverse Green's function, which is equal to the inverse independent part of Green's function, plus the potentials. And uh, why we can do this? Because we can always transform the variation of, the, of, a, of an operator in terms of the variation of the inverse operator. Do you know this? How to do, how to do that? Normally, if you have, uh, this is a, an exercise uh, uh, for you, I will write it here and then I will put the camera. Normally, if you have variation of a Green's function, you can always write it as Green's function, variation of the inverse Green's function. Green's function again. You can try it to prove, uh, to prove that. Okay. And if you believe that, now it's just a matter of putting uh, g minus one there, and uh, and you will find that uh, you have to do the function of derivative. So this uh, depends on the external potential only because it's uh, the g minus one is really the resolvent of the independent particle. So it depends only on the on the external potential. So it's only a delta. And uh, to do this, uh, others. Uh, variation, we do exactly what we did in TDDFT. We pass through the in TDDFT, we do the, we did the cross product with the density. Here, we do it with the Green's function. And when we do it uh, with the Green's function, we have here just a Coulomb interaction, exactly like in TDDFT, with a couple of extra delta, because we were starting from a four point. We have our unknown, the sigma. And so we have the variation of sigma with respect to the G, exactly like we had in the DDFT, the variation of the unknown, the exchange correlation potential with respect to the density. And we have uh, L again here, because it's the, by definition, the functional derivative of G with respect to the external potential. Okay. And here we can uh, define G times G, the product, which is not a full polarizability, but it's a sort of an independent polarizability. We just call it L0. Okay. And so we have again, you recognize it? It's a, a Dyson equation for the polarizability, exactly like we had for the TDDFT counterpart for the chi. We had the Dyson equation in terms of a, a chi zero, in this case is L zero, which is again, the product of two Green's functions. So in the case of chi zero is the product of the two Konechan Green's functions. And this is the, for the full Green's function, G, G, that's not G zero. And we have defined the, 
the product of the of the Green's function L0, and uh, we call it psi, the kernel, but anyway, it will be just a variation of sigma with respect to G. Okay, so this was basically the derivation of the beta sub theta for the polarizability. Okay. Any question? Yes. Yeah. So this two point uh, green function is basically now the integral that we have here. No? We have the right hand side of the equation. <coughs> yeah. So it is basically the two point green function that you put in the previous slide in connection to what Matteo said. Yesterday, we correspond to a two-point green function. I don't understand the uh, two thirty-two particle green function. Well, yes, the L oh, yeah. L can be seen as the two-particle green function, which is clearly four-point, um, but uh, reduced by the product of two one-particle green functions. Okay, but this is just a definition. Okay, we could uh, define a better salt Peter equation for another quantity related to 2L, like the G2. It would be a little strange, but uh, it will have exactly the same shape. L0 is like I times G, G, no? Yes, product of two grid functions. Product of two grid functions. So whatever is left in this equation which is boxed, that would be equal to. I'm at a four point quantity. It it's a four point quantity. Um, if you want to have it in a different way, what you could do is the following you get the, um, you get the head integration again. Oops. Okay, let's imagine. To start from the equation for the vertex, multiply on the left times g, g. So you multiply here g, g, you have g, g, and you call the g, g gamma n. You have the same quantity with the correct uh, index, of course. You do all the integrals correctly. You arrive at the same quantity. Well, you arrive at the slightly different one because this doesn't contain Hartree. So you will arrive to a reducible polarizability. And then to the, you need the, another Dyson equation to go to the irreducible one, but it's the same quantity. It's an L uh, tilde, we call it. It's a reducible quantity. Um, and you can arrive to this by this. And this, you clearly see what is uh, related to. It related to this vertex. So but uh, even here, the vertex that is a three point point, but the complexity of this is still four point because you have this four point ingredient here. So solving the vertex equation is equivalent to solving the Bayes equation. It's exactly the same thing. We just uh, write it in such a way to appear like a dozen equation for a polarizability, which we know that when we take the diagonal, it gets directly to our measurable quantity that we compare with the experiment, the linear response polarizability. But you could also do it from the from this point of view. You multiply times G and G with the correct indices, and then you integrate it over and you will find again the, the end. Can you go back to the, the equation for yeah. Did, did we actually simplify the problem? Because no. on, the, on the left, there are still the particle function in the L uh, set. Yeah, yeah. but this is so far, it's just a rewriting an equation for the polarizability to obtain an equation similar to the TDDFT. Okay, we haven't solved it for that. Now we see how to solve it. Because so far, this is nice written on paper with all this uh, uh, space, time, and, uh, and even spin uh, variable here. So it's, uh, it's a nasty business here. So we haven't solved anything so far. We have just rewritten, re rewritten the, 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 the formula in this way. <laughs> uh, so far, we don't gain anything. This is a question from uh, from uh, the chat. Considering the similarity between TDDFT, Chi, and Bedesal-Peter, what one gains more than TDDFT while in BSE 
one needs to deal with the 4.10 kernel instead of the two. Yes, we don't gain so far anything, but uh, let's have a look again at the comparison. Here we have clearly yeah, a comparison. And, uh, and so far we haven't gained anything. We have just written the same exact quantity in two different formalism, one more complicated than the other so far. But, uh, what do you mean uh, with the B? I mean, how do you find B external over two points? Well, that's uh, just uh, because in the, um, what we do in, uh, in this um, uh, functional formalism, what we say is that this is uh, an external potential, a fictitious external potential that at the end of the calculation, we, took, we take it to zero anyway. So this is uh, uh, particularly important in our case uh, um, because uh, in the Green's function formalism, if you don't define uh, the potential as a two point quantity, then uh, when you start doing your, uh, your um, development, um, all the, it's very difficult to find the correct orders of time. And so this will appear as, as uh, this eta function that we have, for example, in the kite zero, we will have so many. And uh, with uh, an external two particles, so the most generalized possible when we deal with the two point Green's function, because the Green's function is a two point, this is uh, very easy to then when we develop things to know okay, exactly the right order. Because even at the end, when we say, okay, now we go from L to chi, and we put uh, the Green's function diagonal, one, one, and the external potential, three, three. But actually, I've been sloppy. Normally we say one, one plus. So it's not the, the same, it's in the same yeah. space, but it's not in the same time, it's a time plus, and the same with the B external, three, three plus. And by doing that, we are assured that we deal with the end of all the time orderings in the correct way. And we can, for instance, decide our two particles, what are those? Are two electrons, an electron in a hole, two holes? We can all define this with this um, eta quantities, and, and this is uh, possible only if, because if at the very beginning we said the external one point, this is uh, ambiguous in this no, sense. But, but it can be one point, I totally agree. But uh, so in, uh, I mean, in, in the action on in the Hamiltonian, this is like a, a coupling term like uh, uh, of yes, and then uh, uh, the function and the Yeah, yeah. In, physical, in physical situation, we never apply a non-local external potential. This yeah. is a, a fictitious thing that we used to derive, and then anyway, it will be zero because we are in linear spots. But it would be different from deriving with respect to twice uh, the external that depends on your one point. So, uh, derivative of the x uh, of three and derivative of the x of four. It's ah, yes, no, no, that's different. That's different because this is a second order. This is a second order polarizability. So you are dealing with the, how the density changed when you apply your potential twice at the square. It will be something like that. So it's another, uh, it's another, uh, it's another thing. But anyway, this is what we do also when we derive the, this kernel. We derive twice. No. Yeah. If it isn't two different point. If it isn't the same point, it seems like a square. So it's a second order. No, no, but uh, I mean, like when you write down the theory, uh, the, two, two derived, the two point function is the deriving by two, uh, uh, two order derivative of the current, of the external current. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, instead here it's one derivative, but of a two point object. Uh, yes. What's the difference that you get the reducible versus the reducible parts? No, I don't know because the reducible versus the reducible is, is only given by the fact that one has the R3 or not. No, 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 it's not that. Okay. <laughs> I, French, French, there is also a question on the. On the so. Yeah, yeah, this is what I'm. I'm I, 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 yeah, I answered. So, so far we don't have any advantage. No, there is a question from the. Yeah, get it. Uh, just one question about the factor of L. Uh, uh, if you say that we take one one three three, we retrieve the key. Yes. So it has a physical meaning. But for the other type of one two three four, one two three four, does it have a physical meaning? 
or it's just an artifact? No, no, it's not an artifact. It's just that the L is a must, much more complicated object. It contains more information. Exactly like uh, 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 in the when you reduce the wave functions to only the density, you are reducing the information. The wave function contains, for example, a lot of information. The L contains a lot of information. And then we decide to get only a part of it because we are interested in not the whole things. We are interested in one particular quantity. In this case, we need just the polarizability for which then we take the macroscopic component and we compare with experiment. Also the chi is in principle a function of one, two. So R1 and R2. But at the end, what, what does it mean all this uh, quantity? At the end, when we compare with the experiment, we take the macroscopic component. We always do the contractions. So we start from L, which contains much more information. For example, it contains not only the, the, the functional derivative of the density with respect to the potential. For example, you, you have also the derivative of the density matrix, for instance, with respect to the external potential. OK, so now we have. Uh, Let's say 20, 25 minutes left. And so I suggest that we skip, except if you really want to know the mathematical details, and we go directly to how do we do in practice? Because uh, uh, otherwise the, the derivation, the continuous derivation will take us some, uh, some time. Okay then, so let me um, go a little bit fast here. So this is clearly a difficult, a question to solve, as has been pointed out also in the, in the chat. And so what, what we can do? First of all, we can start doing all the approximation that we know have been working quite well for the self-energy, right? So we can start using the GW approximation for the self-energy. And this means that uh, we get um, uh, to a, to a self-energy that is um, uh, only given by G and W, and then we remove the second derivative there and we approximate this with just a W, which is again a two-point function. Now you might wonder, but this is a two-point function. And the other term in the kernel was V, which is also a two-point function. So at the end, we have a kernel, which is two-point functions. Again, back to the question in the chat. But actually, if you look at the indices, they are not the same. This is V57 and W56. So it's, it's two point plus two point, but they're not the same two point. And this is correct. We are still dealing in the pedestal Peter with a four point kernel. We are still dealing with the propagation of an electron from one to two and a hole from three to four. So still four point. We haven't solved it yet. But now we have an equation that we can do another approximation that we very often use, actually almost always use which is the static double approximation. So we take only the static component of the screen Coulomb interaction, unlike what you did yesterday for the self-energy object, it was a <coughs> We take it um, static, and this takes to the extra, approx uh, extra uh, simplification that since V is already static, it's the Coulomb interaction, and now also W is static, and so time is homogeneous. At the end of the four times, get reduced to only the difference of two times. So just one frequency in frequency space. And so from now on, when I write uh, one, two, three, four omega, the one, two, three, four only means special um, points, special indices, not times anymore. Trash. Please repeat again why W is still a four point in the previous slide. Ah, because no, W itself is two point factor. It's the screened Coulomb interaction, two point. Epsilon minus one R R prime times uh, V R prime R second, you integrate over one. So it's two point. And V is also two point, but they are not the same two points inside the, the, the kernel. So the overall kernel is still four points. They are not the same, but if we do the integration, there are some delta from the rest of delta distribution. So at the end, we put 5 8, 5 8, it's all in those. Yeah, areas. but the delta, also the delta, if you look, they are not the same. Yeah. They don't contract the same quantities. But at the end, five, we will have 5 and 8 for the, for the last one, for the potential, and for the W1, we will have 5 and 8 too. 
Yeah, but if you, for example, do you, that, let's suppose that you want to do the infinite row at six. Well, you have the, um, the delta there in the, in the six. So when you have this, um, the L V L, sorry, L zero V L, you will contract one of the indices. But when you use it on the other, it will contract another indices of the L. So at the end, you will have two blocks that again have, uh, have not the same um, index, uh, index um, order. And so you haven't solved the, the problem. No, no, it's intrinsically four points. You cannot, uh, instead, if you remove W, you have only have V, then it becomes two points. But to get, uh, keeping both of them, no way. Okay, uh, and the other uh, things that we have to decide is L0, because L0, you remember, is G, G. And now, what do we use? Because we don't have G. We use uh, the G coming from the GW calculation. So you have uh, either the GW wave function, if you really have done a self-consistent calculation or a quasi-particle calculation, or very often what we do is uh, we take the same wave function coming from the DFT calculation, and we just correct the energies, what you did yesterday. You didn't correct the wave function, you corrected only the energies. And so you have the new Green's functions, Green's function times Green's function, you have the new kind zero, which is a kind zero GW. So this is our L0, and now you put everything there, and you have to do a little bit of manipulation to arrive to something, because this is still a, a sort of a, um, Tyson equation that you will have to invert for a solution, and it's in a four-dimensional space anyway. And so we don't do that. We go to a, uh, we go to a, a new basis, the wave function basis, so the, not the wave function, the orbital spaces or the transition spaces will multiply everything by the a set of uh, complete wave function. Not astonishingly, again, are the DFT con sham that you have already calculated, because uh, then you can uh, skip this. Then uh, when you do that on the L0, you will see that you multiply everything by the wave function. Since you are using the same wave function, it becomes a lot of delta functions. Anyway, this is mathematical details. You will get a diagonal at zero. And so in this basis, at the end, you will arrive, let me go quick on that. You will arrive to, to an equation in which your L is written in this way. One over omega, that comes from the zero, minus an excitonic Hamiltonian, we call it, written in this, uh, in this space. And, uh, and so this is, uh, again, our, uh, our L. Instead of, it's still a solution of the Dyson equation, but we have written in a different way using this space. And um, this uh, uh, transition in one, two, and two, and three, two, and four are, uh, can be, can span to all states. Huh? So N1 and 2 can be between valence and conduction, but it is also from conduction to valence, valence to conduction, and all the combination are possible. Okay? If, uh, you rem I will make a connection with the Cassini in a moment. Okay, and in Tam Dankov, what we say, we'll remove the anti-diagonal uh, blocks. And this is the equivalence because it's the same structure of the Cassini equation. Only in the Cassini, we have Vxc. In the Vedas and we have W. Okay, and the advantage of writing this in this way this is the spectral representation of the inverse of an operator. We can write it in terms of its eigenvectors and eigenvalues, okay? And, uh, and this is the overlap between left and right eigenvectors because the problem is not addition. But in Tamdankov it is. In Tamdankov it is, and so it is uh, eigenvectors on the numerator, eigenvalues on the denominator. And of course, this omega minus these eigenvalues of the excitonic Hamiltonian becomes the poles of the L, the poles of the polarizabilities, or they are the excitation energies. So the excitation energies are for us the, uh, the eigenvalues of this uh, problem that we have to diagonalize. So what we can do with that? Let me go to directly to uh, the result. So once we have the eigenvectors and eigenvalues, we put them back, 
we go back to the G space or uh, R space, whatever, we take the macroscopic component. And so at the end, the equation for the Venus Peter is, we need to diagonalize. We take again the psi psi of the wave function in the DFT, and uh, we get the macroscopic dielectric function, and from there, all the spectrum. But we need to do that. And you can now compare with the independent particle. It's not that different. It's very similar, but we have important differences. In the independent particle, we have the poles into the Konechamp differences. Very bad. Now we have the poles into the diagonalized excitonic Hamiltonian, the, the E lambda. And the numerator here, the, all the transition were considered as independent between valence and conductions, and you sum them over, independent. And now they are all mixed. Because you see now the square, uh, the square modulus is outside the sum. So now we have that all this transition previously independent. Now they are mixed over. They are mixed up by the eigenvector of the excitonic Hamiltonian. And they produce the correct oscillator strength. Well, the correct if we had the exact Venice Peter. We made a lot of approximations here. But uh, the results are good. So this is the Venice Peter for silicon. So clearly an improvement with respect to all the other all the other methods. Uh, this is for argon. Again, you get the excitonic peak. You can go, you can, Valerio showed a much better calculation. This is not compared to the K points. You can actually get also the Rydberg, the Rydberg series. But this was only 200, and, uh, 200 K points. Okay, and this is in general also for system with the lower dimensionality, like tubes or uh, porphyrins. You get uh, you get a good uh, good result. You can also go to X-ray absorption to see the, the difference in the energies. Here we have hundreds of energies. You get them. Uh, you get them as well. Um, and uh, you can also go. I don't want to upgrade now. Uh, to high momentum transfer. So you don't have to do this at Q equal zero. You can do for all momentum transfer. In that case, you will have a spectrum that depends on the energy and the momentum. And again, this is the case of the inelastic is rescattering of hexagon at the end. You'll see the difference between the uh, uh, experiment and Venus and Peter is very small, but the independent particle approach doesn't capture the experts by definition. Okay, questions so far before uh, we start talking about the code that we're gonna use. So this part, I don't uh, um, pretend that you have followed all the necessary steps to arrive to the, final, uh, to the final formula because, well, that was a choice. We have the polarizability equation that we can write as uh, in uh, the TDTFT, and we just make a basic transformation to add to a simpler way to write our Bethes Alpine. But this is just a mathematical manipulation. All the physics is inside this, um, this uh, excitonic Hamiltonian that contains the difference part. Okay, you know? Has uh, anybody tried to do a T-metrics approximation <laughs> for the, the bubble plus uh, at first order of the perturbation theory treating the exchange. Yes, I don't now remember the results, but uh, yes, definitely the key matrix uh, have been uh, uh, used. Ferdiar and Setiawan did uh, some uh, calculation for the homogeneous electron gas. Um, if we used like this, you know, um, first of all, in the T matrix, you have uh, the possibility to decide uh, easily, for example, uh, uh, whole, whole, uh, or electron, electron uh, um, kind of excitations. Um, but one problem that exists uh, anyway when you write the T matrix in the normal way, the, in the first order way, is uh, that it's unscreened. It's totally unscreened. And this uh, is not necessarily good for, uh, for solids. I mean, one can take the T matrix uh, approximation with the screened uh, lines in between. And then, yeah, but these uh, are higher, higher order. 
Okay, it depends on what you call Yeah, it depends on how we see the things. But the T matrix, for example, like we see in, uh, for example, in Strinati, in the in the, uh, the approach that gives Strinati for all this polarizability, second order, second um, uh, order Prince function polarizability, there is also a T matrix, and it is completely unscreened at the first order. And only afterwards, it will become screened. And for this, I really don't have any, any, any idea because I don't know the uh, implementation of that. Francesco? Yeah. May, may I add a comment? Yeah, of course. Ah, it, it, well, if someone is interested in these moms, there is the, uh, the, there's a group on Toulouse, uh, Pina Romagnello, they apply the team matrix uh, for molecules. Yeah, but it's a screen. Huh? It's a screen, yeah, yeah, but just if you want to see for molecules, yeah, it's a new yeah. paper on archive, these moms. Yeah, yeah. They also given, they also went to the free order, not the third order density matrix, right? Free particle, sorry, free, free particle density matrix. Ah, I don't know, okay. But, uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, but uh, I mean, for more model system. And these are models indeed. But I don't know how good this is. Do you have any idea? This uh, no. no, I didn't read the paper yet. Okay. Okay, so exercise for you. Can try. But uh, there is a simple limit in which the this approxim I mean, uh, as you can show that this approximation, you get the right, uh, uh, the quote, you solve exactly the two-body problem for the electron and the whole of it. Well, um, yes, the, 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 the full better salpeter is an exact. No, 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 the full better salpeter, okay, but uh, when you do all the, the approximation steps. I mean, because the most important thing, for example, for RTM, RTM material is to get the, to solve exactly the two-body problem. And uh, uh, I mean, uh, then if you do not solve exactly that, then you add this, and you do a bit better for uh, the exchange, it's not so important. Yeah, what, what, what you mean, if I understand, is that uh, uh, for this kind of system, you said 2D. So 2D. Yeah, 2D means uh, large by the Exactly. So you have a very, very reduced effect of the screening. So the electron in the hole, they can uh, interact themselves very, very strongly. And so the, the ability to describe text W, the W that appears in the Bethesal Peter, this is one important, uh, one important part. And in fact, you get it, uh, for example, for the alcohol. The fact that you get it for the alcohol. Mm -hmm. uh, it's exactly this. Now here you cannot see it. Uh, in, sorry, inside. you don't see it because um, it was not completely converged the calculation. But actually, you get the series, and the series is only the result of putting the W there, because this W is equivalent to solving in a screened way the uh, the Rydberg series. <laughs> Okay, since we all want coffee, let's go to the things that we have to do this afternoon. Oops. Okay, so you see, um, Everything that you that you need are the Cone-Shambui function because it's our uh, our basis. You need the GW correction that enters in the excitonic uh, uh, Hamiltonian, or if you have done the calculation only in one point, you will need a number which is your scissor operator correction. In that case, you don't need the file. Put it in the input file, and you need, of course, the screening to evaluate the W. To do the better subpoena. You need the screening that you have calculated already, for example, yesterday. You can recalculate it again. Uh, and you calculate it to do the GW, right? So now you have again calculated W. And this is what it is calculated inside. So these files are the one that normally you, you need the wave function file, the screening file. And in case if you have really a lot of correction, you will also need the GW file. In the case you only have one, you don't need the file, you put the value of your correction into the input file. And, uh, and so uh, to do that, you will have to execute the, the P code or the X code in the exact same way. Uh, 
uh, as you did for uh, TDTFT. Um, it's important to put this flag into the uh, input file, Exiton. So you will go into this uh, formalism of the uh, transition, uh, transition space. Um, if you don't put anything, you will do an Exiton calculation, which is the default, but you can also do a simple RPA calculation in that. It's just uh, redoing the TDDFT in the RPA approximation, but in transition base, exactly like we do in, in the Casida equations. And then we have all bunch of uh, the same things that we have seen in DP. All these things have the same, uh, the same uh, meaning, the range of the frequency, the, the convergence in the G vectors and everything. And if you also want to try that, but uh, anyway, we, we haven't talked about, is, is that we can also diagonalize in an iterative way. In that case, we put the flag hydro because it's the hydro diagonalization method. So what I would like you to do this, uh, this afternoon is to start adding effect to your calculation to see how the spectrum evolve. So if you look at the excitonic Hamiltonian, you see that uh, if you take only the first uh, terms there, EC minus EV, this corresponds to doing an independent particle RPA, just k zero, because you are using only those elements, the Konishan eigenvalues in your, uh, in your um, Hamiltonian. Then you can put uh, the local fields, the B, which also appears in TDDFT. And in that case, you have a fully RPA calculation. If you also include the GW corrections, you will have a GW RPA. So your, your spectrum immediately will be shifted by that amount. And only when you put also the W, you will have the full basis RPA. And so by doing that, and for example, I will suggest you to start by this, for doing all the convergence calculation, because this is very fast, and this is likely longer because you solve here the full four-point four point, um, uh, diagonalization. And, um, and by doing that, you will see into your, your spectrum all the effect that that's had, and you will see the effect of the, the exit of forming. The blue, the red shift with the increase, uh, uh, with the increased uh, uh, oscillator strength. Okay, this is what uh, we have to do this afternoon. And now, I think we are perfectly on time, but please, question? Just a quick question, but in terms of the convergence for the key points, one should do directly with the VSC level, no? Yes, you can do that because um, uh, anyway, for the K points, you have seen that already, you will have to start all over again and create a new wave function file, a new screening file, if you want to change the number of K points, and then a new Bethesdorf Peter calculation. So you can do that at the very end, when you have compared to everything else, and then you see with two K points, what are the effects. And then you said, oh, I would, I would like, for example, for silicon, obtain a full spectrum, like the one that I show. You can do it, you have to use a, a grid which is 444 with the four shifts. So it's 256 K points. This will last for, uh, I don't know now in this cluster machine, but I would say something between five and 10 minutes for each of you. Um, but the two K points will run immediately. It's order of the seconds. So this is no, no problem. And uh, this is the problem of the beta video. It's the four point, it scales bad. So you do two K points, couple of seconds, you start increasing the number of K points and it explodes. Okay. Even at the delta here, uh, we have or also Cronecker? The, what? Delta. Oh no, these are just Cronecker's delta in this case. No, the big, uh, the big uh, delta. Ah, delta sorry, delta. sorry, sorry. Okay, now I understand the correction. Um, yeah, so the numbers that are coming out from your GW calculation are complex in principle. Okay. Uh, and so the real part we associate to the, indeed to the um, shift in the, in, the, in the spectrum. But you can also use the imaginary part. If you have done uh, a good uh, GW calculation, these are the lifetime effect of the excitations. And you can also put them and you put them Yeah, nobody tells you here that this eta has to be 
the same for each uh, for each uh, excitations. You can uh, use the eta coming from the lifetime effect that you obtain in the GW. So they are uh, complex in principle. 90% of the calculation, we just take the real part for the shift and we use that like that. But uh, this uh, lifetime effect can be important. For example, this move out nicely, the spectrum at higher energy, where the, uh, the, the imaginary, yeah, yeah, in the, when you go to higher range of frequency, for example, in energy loss or in, in elastic stress scattering. And so let me now answer back to the question uh, by Masoud. Now, what is the advantage that uh, with the, the beta salpeter, we solve a much more complicated uh, equation, but we are able to give uh, approximation to the self energy. So, in the functional derivative of the self energy, not in this case, will be the W, that are much more effective. So, it is a very hard job to improve the FXE functional of the density and that's it so very simple in, in theory but uh, difficult to to find a good approximation while in the grids function formalism we are able to find much better approximation that uh, that contains the physics in a much more efficient way and that's why we need to do that of course we are also in our group we've been attempts to for example to obtain uh, effective kernel that can work in TDDFT, but they get uh, the good result of the pedestal Peter, but it's still, uh, it's still pedestal Peter like, uh, uh, let's say complications. It's uh, today we cannot have simple FXE kernel that are able to produce excitonic effects like in pedestal Peter. No, no way, not today. Okay. So I think it's time for uh, for a break. We we'll resume in uh, in half an hour uh, with the uh, with um, uh, Claudio, who is already there in the audience. So we we'll leave you for a moment, uh, Claudio. We're gonna have a coffee. Okay. Bye bye.